And that way we were wow. able to go for Christmas that year and I could meet her family. Yeah. Um, and then the next step was her getting her uh, temporary permanent residence card. That is the official title, temporary permanent residence card. So <laughs> props to the U.S. government for coming up with that. <laughs> Trek out to to Warsaw quite a bit, yeah, or, or recently at least. Yeah, this is like um, the second time I've seen you in what? Yeah, this was, is was second that a week time ago in a, or in a month. Yeah, it was two weeks ago. I can't remember now. Me neither. It all kind of blurs together. <laughs> yeah. I've just been doing a lot of shows, which has been great. Yeah. Um, but that means spend a lot of time on the road, and you know, I think I've just been doing that for so long that. Um, you, People, people give me a lot of sympathy, or maybe that's just the Polish attitude. Like, oh, you have to be five hours on the bus again. Poor yeah. Jujin. And I'm like, dude, I sleep. I use the free Wi-Fi. I get more work done on the bus than I do sitting at home in my office. At home, there's too many distractions. I'm like, oh, play with the kids. Oh, do a load of laundry or just not do work. I can find yeah. every excuse. But if I'm on the bus, there's nothing else to do. And um, I don't mind sitting still for that long. So... The travel, the travel's just just normal, and I right. like being in that's, different places. That's cool. I'm just, I'm never productive during or or after even. I think I, I don't know. First of all, I can't. I just can't sleep on the bus. That's I, it's something I'm hoping I can still learn because I have. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I feel cramped in there, and there's always somebody that I find lots of distractions on the bus. There's always somebody talking loud on their cell phone, like telling their entire week to a person who probably doesn't even care either you know like somebody just well you're describing you're still their person. meal <laughs> you're still a person that understands what they're saying i still have that advantage yeah, yeah i guess so is it is it really easier for you to to block out it's, noise it's, because it's, it's foreign it, it used to be somewhat? way easier and i noticed it and i have a joke about that in my stand-up and now i have to kind of modify it because yeah. i'm reaching this scary territory in my comprehension of polish that I understand more. So because I understand more, I'll tune in more. I'm like, wait, I don't want to care about what you just bought at the store or mm -hmm. like some girl. All I heard was one half of the conversation, but it was like the stupidest conversation because she was so mad. And just this one phrase stuck in my head. She's like, Dois ja cornflakes, ali tonyes cornflakes. <laughs> like she's arguing about cornflakes, but uh, like some knockoff brand. I don't know, but it was really important at the time, and she yeah. had to talk about it on the tram. And I was yeah. like, "Oh my god, I know what you're saying. This is bad." That's funny. She was probably talking about authentic cornflakes, and you're probably like, "Well, the cornflakes you eat are not the ones I'm used to either." It's not now the same, <laughs> it's, baby. It's baby, not it's Kellogg's. all a knockoff. <laughs> Just get over yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's one of the, one of the first things that uh, struck me when I came over here because like when you have cornflakes in the U.S. it's almost always Kellogg's right that's yeah that's the, probably right or is it that, d differ by region no Kellogg's yeah. Kellogg's is kind of like the main the stable most popular and then, brand right? depending on your family philosophy if you buy the store brand like the Albertsons right, knockoff right. brand then it's just whatever but I don't even yeah. know if any other cereal companies have their version of cornflakes because when you say cornflakes you just think of the rooster yeah. and kellogg's yeah, and yeah they have that. other like b wheat bran or whatever right but there's wheaties and yeah. frosted flakes and that's yeah like, and here though the most popular ones i think they're like made by nestle or some yeah. other which is a well it's all kind of the same thing but kellogg's is is not part of a are they like craft foods or something now? Do you know? Oh man, see, I'm usually pretty good about this stuff, and this one thing I couldn't tell you. Okay. Um, okay. Cause I, I wouldn't be that surprised if they were independent, because some of the the old cereal companies have remained. Uh, but okay, but the, all right, they're General Mills probably, which ties That's into something. That's definitely Nestle because there's Cheerios big. out here, and Gen and Cheerios is General Mills in the oh. states. Okay, so it's actually this. I mean, it's the same parent company it's just yeah. a different product yeah that's weird yeah i can't i can't remember everything off the top of my head but i've been curious you can't. about that i'm so, i know you don't know everything <laughs> there is to know about american culture not Jim? everything because i know a lot and i get frustrated when i can't yeah. rattle it off because i've been interested in this or i've seen those graphics of like here's the company and the other companies about the parent company and sometimes there's even a parent parent company yeah. and it's all the one giant conglomerate corporate beast yeah and then they do strange things like craft foods which is a 
gigantic one, right? They changed their name to Mondelez, Mondelez. Did you hear about that? No. You can see it on some, I saw it recently on some like candy bar or something. I was like, that's weird. It sounds like Spanish or something. In the but States it's, or it's here not, in Poland? No, globally, I think. Oh, okay. And, you know, go f- figure why they do that. I think maybe once they get to be too big, they try to like camouflage themselves more. It's yeah. it's interesting, but yeah, they get over the bad image. Yeah, all I remember is that for a while, Evedo was Kraft, and you could see the Kraft logo on right. it because it went through a couple of different hands, and yeah, and then like Japanese bought it or something. Yeah, and now weird. it's a uh, Korean Jap- Japanese conglomerate, which really just means that they have nothing to do with the production. It's just a company that owns companies for the sake of making money. Right. So yeah, yeah Evedo is no longer Polish. Hmm. Um, and someone told me recently, because I always used to pump up uh, Coffee Heaven, because that was, it was started in Poland, it was a Polish franchise, and I think it even started a branch out into other countries, but based in here. And then someone told me recently that that was bought by somebody, so I have to check on that. I yeah. Don't know. yeah, I'm not sure. Like by, uh, is it Costa Coffee or something? One of the other... Like is a, Costa the bigger? No, Maybe. one of the British or like Spanish chains or something? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't go into there, so I'm not that interested. But that, yeah, that's it's kind of it's good to know because some people I don't know how many people do that consciously to like choose the Polish uh, chain over Starbucks or something. But not not enough, and I don't know how but, much yeah. it matters. I just like to stay informed. Yeah, like, just to know that uh, even if you're making the wrong decision, at least in it, it's an informed decision. You know, <laughs> it's exactly. Based, <laughs> it's based on some kind of facts. Yeah. I like to know when I'm making shitty decisions. <laughs> are, are you comfortable, Jimmy? You need I anything feel, else? I'm good. I got coffee. I got water. Right. I feel. Yeah, I had a good. I slept. I slept deep actually on yeah. the bus because I didn't go to bed till late last night. Um, at early Valentine's with my wife because we're not going to see each other oh. um, uh, this weekend. So we had a little date and then we got home and went to bed and I woke up at uh, 5 to catch the bus out. And, and all I remember was it was so realistic. I thought it, I thought it wasn't a dream. I had one of those dreams where like you can't open your eyes. Yeah. So I must have been really deep, but I had a dream that like the girl working the bus was trying to wake me up so I could move my stuff and someone could sit next to me. And I was like, Przepraszam, pani, przepraszam, I nie mogę otworzyć oczy. And I was like, ah. And then That's I finally weird. woke up and I was like, oh, that was just a dream. But I feel good now because I was out. Wow. It was nice. That's not, I don't think, I, I, I mean, I rarely remember my dreams that well, I guess, but it's not, I can't remember having an inception dream like that, then, <laughs> like within one, another. No? Oh, God, that happens to me all the time. I don't know why. It must symbolize something. I've never looked that up. But, like, those (laughs) dreams where either sometimes they're they're, um, non-threatening, like like this one. You know, my life wasn't being threatened. But other times, it's like, yeah, someone's chasing me, and I know it's a dream. So if I could just open my eyes and the physical effort that I'm trying to put in just to, like, peel them or I'll go like this, and they still won't open. My dream hands are trying to open up my dream eyes, and they won't open. (laughs) Fuck! (laughs) And I can't breathe, and then I finally open up. There's the, probably it symbolizes some, something in some my kind of anxiety, yeah. fucked up head. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. Um, all right, let me try and ask you some actual questions, though. Let's do uh, it. Wh- where are you from originally? Um, the shortest answer is I was born in Cleveland, and I lived there till I was 11 or 12, and then my whole family moved to Arizona, and I lived in Cave Creek. BFE, which stands for butt fucking Egypt, like middle of nowhere, like horse country. <laughs> the closest place to buy anything was a half hour by car. Really? So we were like really out in the middle of nowhere. And then I went back to school in Ohio, and then I lived in Chicago for a couple of years. I lived in New York for a little bit, and then I just toured around. So when people ask me, I usually try to yeah. say Cleveland, uh, Phoenix, Chicago, because those are the three main places I identify with. Right, yeah. And then I get flack, like, well, you can't be from all three. You have to pick one. I'm like, but yeah. I'm not like, you know, I spend equal amounts of time on exactly, the yeah. Midwest and the Southwest. That but, they, they, you know, they, they built me up for who I am. So that's my homes. And then Chicago was where I, you know, I started my professional career. I met my wife there. And, mm-hmm. and that was like, I still have strong friendship connections there. So there's, there's a big piece yeah. of Chicago. Yeah. But when did you move to Chicago? You're, you're right after, adult right life, after huh? school. Okay. When I was 22 or three or something like okay, that. Okay. Yeah. So that's, those are 
I guess they don't call them formative years maybe anymore, but they are for, yeah. sh- for sure. Yeah. Cause you come out of the, you know, the little bubble of academia where yeah. everything's all safe and you do whatever you want. And then you're in the real world and it's like, Oh, get a job and actually start trying to make money using the diploma that you took out a giant loan for and are still <laughs> paying off. Yeah. So go work in an office. Yeah. What, what did you study? A I, number of things probably. Yeah. Or, well, um, in the end, my diploma just says theater. I have a diploma, okay. I have a degree in theater and acting, but I was on a path to try to get a degree in performance art because the school I went to was pretty open for that. Um, or I was going to try to do a minor in dance because I took a lot of dance classes. I j- yeah. I really just tried to work the system so that I could take all the classes I wanted to take and I wasn't too concerned about the piece of paper because I figured that's not going to be a big deal anyway. So, yeah. like, I did two study away programs. That was my time in New York. Then I went to Connecticut and studied at the National Theater Institute. And that's when I went to St. Petersburg, Russia for the first time. I did two weeks out there at the Theater Institute. Whoa, took, that's, uh, that sounds like a story, too. It was, well, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was my first time. No, second time because I, I came to Poland for the Pantomime Festival in 2000. And then 2001 went to St. Petersburg and... Okay, so, it, yeah, it wasn't your first uh, contact with Eastern Europe or whatever. No, it was just the second, but it was all Eastern. Like, um, still, I've only been to yeah. London one time. I've flown through France, and depending on where you classify Germany, most of my experience has been Central and Eastern Europe. Germany is just Germany. They no, don't, Germany, yeah. Germany they don't, is they don't its own Europe. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> we are our own. Yeah. That's all. Um, but, yeah, the only crazy story that comes back from the St. Petersburg is uh, – yeah, you know, we had a, a, a university student that worked as our translator to translate the classes and then to help us uh, sightsee around town. And she uh, organized for us to go clubbing one night. But the group kind of got lost and split up. And I was with a couple of girls from the program. And we didn't know where we were. And we were walking down the street. And we see this lump in the road. And it was a guy who I think got hit by a car or something. But he was lying there probably dead with his head open and his brains on the street. <laughs> Jesus. That was that was my St. Petersburg experience. But then the weirdest was that the, like they were like, "Fuck, that's crazy." For one and two, we should tell someone. Maybe yeah. let's like inform. So we went into like Russian Jabka, whatever convenience store, and there was a couple of police there, and we didn't know any Russian, but we were like, "Man, lying brains out," yeah. and they didn't care. They <laughs> so didn't care. They were like, well, and they walked away in the opposite direction. Wow. And then we finally made it to the club and drank ourselves silly just because we were like, okay, that's yeah. apparently Russia. I don't know. <laughs> this is fucked up. Yeah, that's insane. That's like even the fact that you see a, a dead man uh, without people around him or like any kind of I don't know, police tape or something or no, bystanders you, like being like, what the fuck? Yeah, somehow he wound yeah. up there and whoever was else involved in that left and anyone else walking on the street. Didn't seem to care. Just us, you know, <laughs> soft, pussy Americans were like, oh, the poor man. We actually care because we have emotions. <laughs> <coughs> Wanted to do something, nothing. So um, that always comes to my mind when I think of St. Petersburg. I mean, it's also a beautiful place with great art, and I saw many things, and I sure, saw yeah. good shows. But the first thing is like, oh, dead man in the street. Yeah, it's uh, kind of hard to to erase <laughs> that image, you know, especially being one of the first things maybe you see. So uh, let's maybe quickly get out of the way, like, why you're here. Yeah, I mean, you have a family now. A yeah, wife, I got a family two, now. But two daughters. Yeah. Yep, you know it. Thank you. Um, but I'll, yeah, if anyone listens to this podcast, maybe this will can be the official version. I'll take a clip and I'll put it on my website so yeah. people don't have to fucking ask me anymore yeah, in yeah, private. Yeah, let's do it. Because <laughs> I just get tired of that, like, oh, because Polish wife is just, um, they just assume because I have a Polish wife that that's the only reason I'm out here against my will, chained to the bedpost when I'm at home. <laughs> And I have no balls to to do otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Because you guys could live elsewhere. And we did. We lived in the states for a couple of years. But like the the short long story is that you know while I uh, even before I hit university I was interested in pantomime and that was my first uh, steps into performing arts and I got really into that and I started taking workshops and getting into the community and I had uh, mentors and everything like uh, teachers that took me under their wing and they were professionals touring around and I'd go see their shows whenever I could. 
uh, and then I became part of a pantomime company, and yeah. we went to Poland to Warsaw for a theatrical pantomime festival in 2000. So I met a lot of Polish pantomimes there, and I discovered that there's just a big dialogue between Polish pantomimes of the Tomaszewski school mm-hmm. and the American pantomimes, more of Marceau and American style. Right. Um, so I had a lot of Polish pantomime friends, and there's this workshop that used to exist in Columbus, Ohio, every summer, three weeks for professionals, and one year... Uh, my future wife came to the, the school, but she flew through Chicago. And I was living in Chicago, and we get this call one day from like, you know Rick Weimer, one of my uh, one of the teachers, and he say, I call you, and we, maybe you can drive me and my friend to to the, the workshop because we had a car. Mm-hmm. So we pick her up from Southside Chicago and <laughs> shook her hand, and that was already like some kind of like weird buzz. Like I don't believe it love at first sight, but I definitely believe in like, what the hell? That yeah. was the main thought. And then, <laughs> you know, within within a couple of weeks, we were we were inseparable. And then after mm. mime school, she still had time left on her visa and um, uh, wanted to, like, explore. But I was like, do you just want to, like, come to Chicago and hang out with me for some more time? And she was okay. And I made space in my closet. And then we spent more time. And <laughs> we postponed her return flight. And we postponed her return flight again yeah. until... We couldn't do that anymore, and then we couldn't uh, extend her visa, and we looked at all the options, like, I don't know, a student visa, or I ran a, a theatrical production company at the time, so I'm like, oh, maybe right. I get you a work visa and make you officially work for us. That'd be cool. No. Uh, then we heard about the lottery. There's some, like, they just give away visas for the lottery. Yeah. So yeah. we found a guy that won the lottery, and we're like, give us advice. He's like, it's a lottery. Yeah. You either win it or you don't. <laughs> I can't tell you anything. There's no pattern. Yeah. Not supposed so, to be. So it was just, there just kind of came a moment in our lives that, yeah, we had only known each other for about uh, a month or two, but we felt so strongly about being with each other that it was kind of like a put up or shut up time. Like we didn't yeah. get married so that she could stay in the States. We got married so that she could stay with me because we knew if she got on that plane, who knows, you know, trying to do right. a long distance thing. Um, so that was the start. And then we uh, we toured the U.S. That was like our microwave getting to know you. Um, uh, tour because I had the year before I had done this uh, school assembly tour like you perform in gymnasiums for middle schoolers high schoolers elementary schoolers and we had an edutainment show called Science Now where I was a crazy professor and she was my clown assistant and we taught science we actually like did weird science experience but with an element of comedy but that meant three shows a day five days a week so you wake up at like 4 or 5 in the morning, drive to the first show, set up, do the show, break down, eat lunch in the car, drive to the second show, do the show, set up, break down, <laughs> drive another six hours to the next state sometimes, get right. a hotel, sleep for a few hours, um, wake up and do the whole thing again. So it was only us for six months. And like halfway through, we just like we were sick of looking at each other and yeah. had to like go sit in the car for a while. But that also <laughs> helped bond us and tie us together. Yeah. And, and that was nice. And then um, and we lived I mean, in- that's a pretty good uh, test of uh, whether you want to spend time with that the rest of your life, whatever, with that person. Right. If you're on the road in a car for that long and and working together and working and in the hotel and and just yeah. and everything all the time yeah, yeah. so th- but there were yeah there were two moments if i get off on too many tangents just let me know but i'm full of stories that's I'm fine i mean shit. yeah um but one of them was yeah like we were in kansas and it was about halfway through the tour and we were just starting to get fucking sick of each other and there's this thing in clown where you um you have like mocking battles. Right? Yeah. All right. Um, so, you know, it's something more artistic, but I don't know. We just started to like tease each other one night in the hotel room. Like, oh, you do, you're like this. Uh, and then you're like this. Uh, and then we just really started to like dig into each yeah. other and get really like, you're like this. Uh. Oh, Jimmy, I don't know. I don't, I can't call a hotel for us. Like, my English, my English. And she's like, uh, I'm just going to sit on the bed and look at the computer and whatever. <laughs> and I'm American, but. <laughs> and at the end, then we were both just like, fuck you. And she took her glasses and threw them against the wall and they smashed. So she had no glasses for about a week. Oh. Oh, wow. She broke her glasses. But then we cooled off, and then it was better. And then the other th- story from that tour is we were in Oregon, and we were on the coast. It was beautiful, and we had uh, we had some time on um, – I think we finished early one day. And we went exploring on the coast, and there were seals on the beach, and we found this place to eat. And we had oysters on the half shell, and it was mm-hmm. awesome. And then the next day, um, I was at the hotel, and 
we're just watching TV, and I started to feel bad. I'm like, hmm, I don't feel so good. And I went to the bathroom, and I puked, and I came back. I'm like, I just puked. But, like, I didn't feel, like, sick, sick. It just kind of, like, yeah. happened. And then I went and I puked again, and it was like that for the next six hours. That was just, like, Damn. and then both ends. So, like, it was either a stomach <laughs> virus or food poisoning. Basically, like. Probably the I was, oysters, right? I, we, mean, I don't know to yeah. this day. And also, we were in schools all the time touching dirty, filthy, disgusting kids. Right, that's so, true. So, could have been. Yeah. <laughs> There's could've, that. There's that. Could have been anything. But the main thing is that, you know, this woman who was my wife for a short amount of time, who I'd only known for a short amount of time, um, got to see me in a very vulnerable position of shitting myself and puking and just <laughs> constantly walking back from the bathroom paler and paler and more weak and more weak. And she had to take care of me. Yeah. We couldn't do the shows the next day. And we were in this hotel that, like... Um, you know how the states are. Sometimes there's no sidewalks and you can't get anywhere if you don't have a car. She didn't have a driving license. So she had to right. like walk on the highway to get anywhere to get me some like Gatorade so I get like rehydrated and nurse me back to health. And then we yeah. finally I got healthy enough to drive and we drove up to Seattle and landed at my sister's because we had some shows in the area. Mm-hmm. And then that night, Anka got sick. So okay. that was our really big bonding experience of just seeing each other in like the worst possible physical state and having yeah. to take care of that person and that was real bonding so that was the whole tour and then we moved to arizona and then we got sick of living in arizona and um oh because basically things bottomed out in chicago and my mom had beaten breast cancer and i felt like i needed to be closer to her for a while wow. so there was that but we spent two and a half three years in arizona ballroom teaching ballroom dance because uh, we were good enough performers and had a dance background, that uh, cool. and we were good salespeople, so we did that. But then we were like, Arizona is dead for art. If you don't draw paintings of the beautiful sunsets or uh, do metal work, there's yeah. nothing in in Arizona. So <laughs> we were like, where to go now? We thought maybe back to Chicago, maybe New York, maybe San Francisco, maybe Seattle. And every day it was something different. And we were like. Um, or I think Chicago. No, I think Seattle. And then we would talk and we'd go to bed and we'd wake up and I'd be like, you know what? You're right, Seattle. And she'd be like, you know what? I think you're right, Chicago. Mm-hmm. And we'd have flip opinions. And But during all this, we would visit Poland every summer and I'd met her family and meet her friends. And I just started to see more and more artistic opportunities out here. Right. Um, like, you know, people working in the theater and the people actually go to the theater and there's all this stuff happening, pantomime, and people care about culture and art. And plus, it seems that way when you're visiting, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. I would still, I would still say that there's people are more willing to go out, more willing to, yeah. more willing to um, patronize art. That's okay. that's the thing. Like, I know it's still hard out here, and I still struggle. I'm, you know, I'm a self-employed performer trying to raise a family out here and it's not so easy but i find it's pretty impressive actually yeah. you can do you can do more things out here and people are more willing to give you money versus the states where it's like oh you want to do improv you want to do stand-up even you want to perform theater in a black box theater great you can mm-hmm. i'm not going to give you any money for it but i'll come see your show yeah and yeah. and pat you on the back that you're a good artist but you still have to work at the bank yeah and and out here i know that still happens you have side jobs but there's just there's just more, or you get like a grant, or my friend that runs the 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 pantomime studio here in Warsaw, he's got all of his support from the government, from the state. There's still kind of like yeah. um, little leftovers from the communist era of state sponsored art, which for all the shitty things that communist uh, communism did, that's actually mm. I think something nice, or maybe that's yeah. more socialism. I don't it's know. not it's not EU funding now. At this point? Or? Oh, God, I don't know the details. Okay. I just know yeah. he always has to write to, like, the local government. And maybe right. they get money from the EU. But, like, yeah, yeah. He, he gets his money and he he runs a whole pantomime studio, which I know no other equivalent in, in the States. It's, see, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So, blah, blah, blah. Just to finish the story, Arizona, we finally decided let's move to, uh, let's move to Poland. Plus... It was during uh, the George Bush years, during the Iraq War, mm. and I would watch TV and see all the conservative pundits be like, if you don't like what we're doing and you don't like the war, you don't support the war, they're like, cut, you can get out. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I can actually. I have a yeah. place to go, so I'm going to do that. Yeah. And then I just watched for three years my wife in this crazy situation, especially on tour, like because she got to see all of the, all of the U.S., mm-hmm. like seeing your country through the eyes of someone that's a foreigner 
is really eye-opening. So she would just like observe things and point out shit that I was blind to because I grew up there and just I didn't see all the intricacies, the details, or just her perspective was fascinating. We'd have these conversations. Then I realized, oh, we could trade places and I could go somewhere totally brand new and have my eyes opened and kind yeah. of start over. And that was the main impetus for coming out here. So it was art. Yeah, there was love mixed in there. And then also just the fucking adventure, you know? Yeah. And then on top of that, we made a baby um, <laughs> after we had decided to move to Poland. And then we found out Anka was pregnant. Um, and we were like, I guess we'll still move. So we moved while she was six months pregnant. I landed not knowing the language, not having a job, not having a place to live, and having three months to get my shit together because there was going to be someone dependent on me in yeah. order to do talk, that. Talk about improv. <laughs> and that was, it was totally <laughs> improv. That's but somehow we crazy. managed because now we have two and they're awesome kids. And now, you know, I'm doing shows all over Poland. So yeah. that ain't so bad. Yeah, so you did. So <laughs> apparently you can fly when you're still six months pregnant. Pregnant? No problem yeah, there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, mean, yeah, that's not a problem. I mean, you can fly later, and I don't know yeah, if it's, it's just, just urban legend or true, but if you give birth on the plane, the baby has free flights for life or something? I've heard that. I've never s- seen or heard it firsthand, right? That yeah, somebody yeah six, somebody, months, six months is safe. And we flew back when my wife was pregnant with our second kid to visit the States about the same time. It's, right. Any of you people, family planning, or if you are pregnant, take it from Uncle Jim. You can yeah. fly. It's no problem. Yeah, take it from me that that's not medical advice. <laughs> you should still probably talk to your doctor because I'm not going to be liable for anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's my podcast. I just have to say that. <laughs> but, but yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you're right. Okay. That's, I mean, that's a lot of information packed in one. I could ask you about a lot of those things that you mentioned that you just kind of gleaned over. It was like, yeah, and then we did this and this, and, and my mom had uh, breast cancer, which I must, it's like a whole nother heartbreaking story. I mean, I'm not that well, we should probably it talk about it, but. I can talk about it because she survived. I mean, that's yeah. the nice thing about mentioning that. I always try to throw that in if I ever mention that time in my life because, you know, it could, it could turn out bad, but, and kind of the sweet thing is that, all right, so because, uh, we basically, eloped we half eloped because we knew each other yeah. for a couple of months i proposed and it was like not i feel even... like i should i mean I, I know we're at this point it's probably too late but we, i feel like i should explain what eloped means i oh. don't know why it just seems uh, elope is like to go away to marry w- without your parents approval or something yeah right or, ju- or, or just to get married without yeah, family different... ceremony right like yeah. on your own so okay. that's that's elope um, so yeah, we, we didn't know each other. I proposed and then, uh, the ceremony was within a month. And so of course her parents couldn't come cause that's not enough time to organize visa travel and anything for poor Polish people trying to get into the States. So they were all blocked and all her friends. So she had no one from her side of the family. And then I called my parents and my mom, who's uh, she's a uh, romantic at heart, and she's like, "I'm coming." But this was after she had just had surgery to remove the the cancer, and she had like drainage tubes and shit. And the doctor was like, "Technically, you can, but like probably not a good idea." Mm-hmm. And she's like, "I'm going," and she just like did. She, she came was out. in Chicago, and you guys were where? She was. She no, we were in Chicago, and oh, she was in Arizona. Okay, sorry, my, my, my. that's all right. I know it gets too complicated story <laughs> in my life, but basically like. Slightly against doctor's orders, and soon after beating cancer's ass, my mom flew out so that she could be at her son's wedding because yeah. to marry a woman that they met one or two days before the actual ceremony, right. and we're like, "Yeah, you seem cool. Let's do this. Great. Why not?" Sure. Yeah. So, so that was all right. But that's... Well, they have faith in you, I guess, which you know counts for. <laughs> I think but... I think I just broke them. I mean, I'm the. Uh, I'm the third of four kids and, um, my, one of my older sisters was a wild child. So she kind of wore my parents down that by the time I uh-huh. came of adult age, they were like, just, just like, don't kill anybody and don't go to prison and everything else. It's probably okay. <laughs> it's probably okay. Yeah. yeah lower expectations. That was all right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. There are a lot of, uh, I guess you have, you have jokes about that. Yeah. Uh, that. A lot of kids in your family? Oh, yeah. You have all sisters, right? I have, Well, I have two older sisters and a younger oh, okay. brother, but the, I'm I'm surrounded by women okay, in my life. The, this uh, is this is normal because it's like if you start to, to trace, my mom was one of seven kids, uh, four of them girls, three of them boys, and then a lot of them had girls. Um, uh, her mom, my grandmother, had more sisters yeah. than brothers. So, like, when I finally did the math, I grew up with, yeah, 13 aunts. Yeah. And there were some <laughs> uncles around, but, 
like this is true a lot of them died when i was a kid yeah and i make the morbid joke of like hmm, i wonder why it was for <laughs> yeah. varying reasons you know heart attack here and a stroke there or, or whatever but it was just like yeah, but all cardiovascular disease like, <laughs> just like like they couldn't related they, to stress yeah. they just like couldn't hang with the sheer amount of estrogen floating around the family <laughs> gatherings they just like couldn't yeah. take because a lot of the women in my family are also alpha females like very strong minded strong women that tend to bring men into the family like okay yes whatever I don't know. Mm-hmm. and i just fucking grew up with that so i yeah i say i'm a of an honorary vagina i'm just a born feminist <laughs> i have to and then yeah. yeah i met my wife who has one sister who also has two daughters so my wife's dad has two daughters and he was raised by his mom, his aunt, and his older sister because his dad got sent off to the war and never came back. So, mm. like, that's another weird kismet thing that that uh, my father-in-law and I share. And it just, like, yeah. it just keeps going. There's <laughs> women connections <laughs> right. nonstop. Yeah, and you have two daughters, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How old are they? Five and seven. Okay. Awesome age. It's just because they're not babies anymore. They're yeah. like little people, and uh, we can actually have fun and do stuff. Yeah, and conversations and stuff. Yeah. yeah definitely. Uh, your wife got uh, – um, how did she manage to get permission to stay in the States? Uh, she got a um, either a student visa or a tourist visa to get into the country because right, she yeah. won a scholarship to go to this uh, pantomime school. Yeah, yeah. And then – um, we got married. Okay, oh, which doesn't, right. which just again for listeners that are curious, maybe this is worth going into detail because that doesn't like sometimes people are like, oh, so you got married, so your wife has an American citizen now, yeah, right? It's just not, it's works not just like that. Yeah. No, basically, no. we got married and entered the hell of bureaucracy that is the path towards just getting a green card. Um, okay. So once we had the marriage certificate, we had to get her birth certificate from Poland and other documents, 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 and make the first applications. The first one was a uh, like a petition to stay in the States while your application is in process. So you're kind of like in this limbo. Yeah. And actually, she couldn't travel for a while. And that really like affected her because not like we could afford to or she wanted to, but just knowing that you can't. Yeah, she's yeah, like, I, like so I can't go to my own country, and if I do, we have to like start all over and lose all that money. But yeah. then you apply for this special form, special permission to travel abroad while you're in the process of, and that way we were wow. able to go for Christmas that year, and I could meet her family. Yeah, um, and then the next step was her getting her uh, temporary permanent residence card. That is the official title, Temporary Permanent Residence Card. So <laughs> props to the U.S. government for coming up with that stupid-ass thing. Um, and then eventually she got her green card, but through through the marriage. Okay. Um, but that's how, how long did that process take? Is it- about, I think we did it in about two years. Wow. Um, wow. And it was, it was a lot of forms. It was a lot of, um, you know, like after we completed this tour – because uh, we had our roommate check in the mail and everything, and and he uh, called us one day saying that Anka got this letter in the mail uh, that told her to report to like a service center in Chicago because her fingerprints had expired. That was her the fingerprints had expired because they're no it, longer you, valid. Yeah, because okay. when you when you apply for a green card or even any visa, you have to get all of your biometrics is the yeah. official. But it's basically all your fingerprints. Like a criminal, they do all five of them and all the angles and all that shit and face scan and everything. Yeah. Um, but then apparently they expire. Which I was like, that's not physically possible. This is some kind of bullshit. Right. Really, I think they just wanted to like have a check in. Yeah. Like, are you still here? Are you not causing any trouble? Let's look at you face to face and yeah. make sure that you're like not covered in swastikas or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but it was yeah, it was just like it was the dumbest thing. And then like I forget what happened, but we didn't have the original document. And all all of these official documents have um, watermarks on them. And if you don't have them, there's always at the bottom of the thread. If you don't comply with the exact date and the exact time and with the exact document, you run the risk of us throwing your case out and you have to start from zero. And it's just like always this heavy-handed fucking shit. So we we yeah. made it somehow. And we organized. Any way to, to get rid of that one person the exactly. more that they have to deal with. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we fucking – we went to, again, Southside Chicago – uh, to this service center, like in a shopping mall. It wasn't any kind of like official government building. It was like some place. 
and we walk in, and it's only a bunch of of sassy black ladies working there. Mm-hmm. And I only say that just to paint the picture because it is a very characteristic of this yeah, experience I mean, to me. Like, <clears throat> I mean, you, you just think sassy black ladies. A lot of people, with, you know, a lot of yeah. women with long tips and black hair. They're like, all right, so you don't have that document? Well, then you have to go away. Or yeah. like, while we were going through the process, this pickup truck full of Asians came in that didn't speak very good English <laughs> and they came in and they're like they had their document and they're trying to comply too and you could see the panic in their faces of like I hope he's good for being here something yeah. something and apparently they went to the wrong service center they should have gone to somewhere in uh, Missouri which is next to Illinois oh, wow. And the people working there la- literally laughed in their faces. They're like, oh, honey, you in the wrong place. You got to go a long way. Don't let the door hit you on the way out, honey. And I was like, that's some cold shit. Yeah. Like, they obviously, like, drove all night, and they were trying their hardest, and they couldn't. And that was just all fucked up. And, of course, meanwhile, there's pictures of Bush and Cheney on the wall smiling, looking down on you. And then I, yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't handle it anymore, and I tried very <laughs> diplomatically, biting my biting my tongue as much as I could. But I'm like, while we're going through, and Anka's getting new fingerprints, I'm like, can I can I just ask you a question? Because like, fingerprints fingerprints don't expire. So how how can fingerprints expire? What is yeah. the and the the response I got was kind of like, if you take the training guide of working for the government with all of, like, the FAQs. If someone asks this, then you answer this. It's like if the woman would have eaten that and then just vomited out the answer because it was literally like, well, your fingerprints expire because 9-11, and then you can change the way you conduct yourself in the world and commit a crime, and then 9-11, and then your fingerprints expire. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not really paraphrasing that much. It was really that jumbled of 9-11, right. you commit a crime, change the way you conduct yourself, and fingerprints expire. <laughs> and that's so, if yeah, anyone's wondering how, that's how it happens. A lot of syllables, 9-11, and that's... Yeah. Don't ask any more questions. That was pretty much it. And then I that's won't... That's crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm yeah. just going to shut up. If we just go and get the fucking stamp, we're good, and we can continue down yeah. this wonderful path. But yeah, green, green card stories, we've always wanted to do like a whole theatrical piece or physical comedy or maybe I'll I'll work it more into the stand-up but we've always wanted to do something with that experience because we just have tons of stories of the green card process experience that is just it's just absurd like the hoops they make you jump through or like one more, if you'll allow me. No, please. When we were, when we were, because we had to move to, we didn't have, we moved to Arizona, so we had to like change address and all that stuff. And then it came time for our interview, because there really is an interview. You go and they try to ask you questions yeah. to see if you like actually live each other, uh, live with each other, or love each other, or whatever. And um, the first thing is you have to surrender all of your cell phone, any kind of devices, because no recording devices in this special place. And then we go to the waiting area, and it's just one door. And every once in a while, like, they tell you again, be here at this date, at this time, or else we could throw out your case. Mm -hmm. So we got there at, like, 7 in the morning, punctually we're there. But, of course, they don't have to comply with that. They just tell you to be there. So, you know, they'll see you. They open the door. Um, John or Ramirez, whatever, because there's a lot of Hispanic people there. No, okay, great. They go in, and you just have to wait there. But the mindfuck thing is that you just have to sit there. Oh, and you can't bring any outside water or food. Oh, seriously? For whatever reason, I couldn't get any explanation for that, but you can't have, you can't eat, can't drink. Um, there's a water <laughs> fountain, because in the States, you know, there's public water fountains. Yeah, a lot of places. But it was out of the waiting room and down the corridor next to the bathroom. So if you wanted to get a sip of water, you would run the risk of having them go, Williams, no, fuck them. Yeah. And that was it. And I'm like, this is like... I couldn't even be that pissed at it because I'm like, this is really, you guys have thought this through to the detail of how, how far up your asshole can we really just like cram it to, to make you our bitch. And that's, that's and that's crazy. it. Want a sip of water? Want to go to the bathroom around yeah, the corner? Yeah, well, you better be quick about it. Yeah. 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 It was, it was, it was ridiculous. So green card stories. Someday you will see on, on billboards that we're doing some big green card performance. Cause yeah. something has to happen artistically. Yeah. But that- um, all right. Getting back to comedy a little bit. <laughs> cause this is, no, this is, a, I don't want to interrupt you cause this is all interesting stuff to me. 
But uh, I do, yeah, I do. This is a comedy podcast. And yeah, yeah. Just get me started on anything. And so, I, well, uh, all right. I guess <laughs> now the question I think of is not directly, but is how do you <laughs> directly tied to it? How do you not know Polish yet, Jim? Fuck, I know. I, I went to the U.S. I learned that shit in like two. Took me two, three years. I was all talking that English. Uh, no, I'm I'm teasing you. I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm just trying to think of a witty way to respond <laughs> because at this point, to jest normalnie, że ja muszę mówić po polsku, bo demonstrować, nie wiem, robić przykład, że tak. że dam radę, mówię po polsku, nie perfekcyjne i i jeszcze muszę uczyć się dalej, mm -hmm. ale dam radę i i oczywiście mogę mówić lepsze po siedem lat mieszkać tutaj. Uh, i, i mogą iść do no, normalnie szkoły językowe i konkretnie uczy się, uczy się, tak. ale to nie jest mój styl i, i też jest, um, jest inna sytuacja. Uh, jeśli uh, jesteś Polak i iść do, do, uh, w Stanach, uh, jest mniejsze ludzi, które mówi po polsku. Mm -hmm. a, a, a tutaj ludzi mówią angielsku i też ludzie są dumne, że ludzie mówią po, po angielsku, że oh, I, yes, I speak English, we just speak English, it's no problem because I want to show you how well I yeah, speak English. speak English. And they want to help me, you know? So, so that made it hard in the beginning too, of like, even when I would try, especially like some of those early stages of development in my language, it would just be, and understandably, too painful for a Polish person's ear. They're like, you know what? I see that my English is shitty, but not as shitty as your Polish. So let's just speak English because it'll move things along faster. Yeah. So I, yeah. you know, I didn't have to. It was less of a sink or swim situation, which is why, of course, yeah. um, like um, I'm still proud to say that even though I don't speak the best, um, I speak better than a lot of my American friends that have been out here 10, 15 years and have barely picked up the language because they're like. Well, I can say please, thank you, and, you know, whatever. It's, yeah. I, young people speak English. If they don't speak English, then I'll go somewhere else. But Yeah, no, you're, you're a, 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 a great exception to the, to the fact that most, uh, most, uh, yeah, most that I know, I guess. I don't know that many English-speaking foreigners here, but most of them do not really pick up Polish. And, mm -hmm. and it's exactly how, how you said it. Yeah, I mean, I never had... Almost never. I mean, I, when I first went to Chicago when I was little, there was like one Polish kid in my class, which obviously helped me a bit. But I never had people be like, okay, let's speak Polish to make it easier for you. You know, that's, or, yeah. or you know, I want to practice my Polish. That's not, that didn't happen uh, on this, in the suburbs of Dallas, especially in Texas. Oh, you know? Jesus. Yeah, yeah probably it's like, not. No. So, so yeah, it's you really have to make more of an effort, and especially as you know, as an adult and everything, it's yeah. a little different. Ale te rzeczy, które ja ja nie rozumiem, jeśli ja mogę powiedzieć, i i to jest trochę krytyczne o moim kolegi amerykański, o przekrawcy, bo bo ja ja nie mogę wytrzymać i nie lubię czując jak dziecko, na przykład nie mogę iść do banku bez żona i mm -hmm. robić coś z siebie albo nie wiem to fucking like to a, to a government office or yeah. just like normal life shit you can't like sign a contract for a phone if the person there doesn't happen to speak English like for a yeah. while I couldn't well, even get my you know most of us don't <coughs> even understand what's in the contract either or we don't read it but yeah but just, of course yeah, yeah I, basic I, things I, I just felt handicapped basically yeah. and that was really a big push to to try to learn more and do better because i'm like i don't like this feeling i still don't like it because i speak better now but when it comes to like specific vocabulary for specific situations um and i can't manage i get really down on myself i'm like i just hate that feeling yeah um yeah, yeah I, I i think i can can relate yeah and and you're you're and you perform in both languages, which is also impressive. Like I mean, yeah. If 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 I had learned English the way you did, <laughs> I'm not no, I'm not I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying like if I had to learn English as like kind of an extra thing, you know, because you could like you said you could pretty much maybe it wouldn't be great, but you could function without it. Yeah, yeah you could definitely yeah. get by without it. Um. I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing what you're doing, you know, because it's just like, it's, it's, it's hard for, because you don't really, th you don't think in Polish or are, not are, yet, uh, yeah, not yet, little snippets, little yeah, snippets yeah. is all I get right now, but no, yeah. I still, I still think in English. Okay, so I guess maybe we could go straight to. I wanted to ask you kind of a workshop 
question to Go change it up it. a little bit because I don't talk about it that much. Is like, you know, I know it's a stupid question to say like, what inspires you, but how do you? Go about writing jokes. Can you maybe describe that process a little bit? Oh, yeah. and, and and Polish jokes as well, yeah. Because you like, I'm sure a lot of that is is translation. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the what got me into stand up in the first place was just being out here for so long, having these crazy observations, talking about them so much, and they kind of turned into jokes themselves. It was all just yeah. based on my experience. So I really started hard with that. Um, so it was like riffing off, off stage before you even started writing it? Eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like my whole stick about, uh, about bathroom doors and balcony doors, like, that was all genuine frustration. Yeah. Like, like this is why people seriously, this is fucking stupid. Yeah. And then I would just mention it so much at parties that it kind of got distilled down to an actual joke. And then I, I gave it some, I gave it some form. Yeah. But it's mostly just observations, and I'm still kind of in that zone of um, going off of my experience as a stranger in a strange land, which I'm. I'm I'm trying not to use it as a crutch now. We're trying not to like pigeonhole myself and I'm yeah. trying to make more general observations about life or culture or like having kids or something that's a bit more universal cuz I feel like I could get stuck uh just talking about yeah. you know American and Poland type of stuff. Yeah. And then not everybody can relate to that or not everybody's interested. Um so that's so that's one thing, but that's and and my first my first ways of writing was to basically get a seed of an idea and I would just take the dictaphone and I'd go into a room by myself and I would just speak out loud for hours on end trying to find the right way to say it and then cutting out and say it in a shorter way and say it in a better way and in a different mm. way. And I didn't do a whole lot of like written text, looking at it and then editing from there. Like if I really got a, a sentence or a phrase that I knew was like the way I wanted to say it, then I'd write that down and, mm -hmm. and, and, and mark that. But the rest was just um, kind of getting a feel for the bullet points and then going out there yeah. and, and saying it. Because um, I, you know, I, 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 I've been a performer for longer. I was right. you know, doing other things, but just being on stage was never the first thing for me to get over. It was just changing forms. Yeah. Um, and then from having all these things to say about Poland. And I knew I was only connecting with the Polish, uh, with the English speaking Polish audience. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to communicate to the Polish speaking Polish audience about all things, ways that I see their country. And plus, somewhere it dawned on me that that would be a great way to learn to Polish. Learn Polish sure. Because, like, when I was teaching more English, that was always my my thing with my students. I'm like, let's talk about something they actually care about because then. Even if you get frustrated, you're more motivated to look up a word so you can get your point across. But if we're talking about like the weather or some stupid business English, it's a lot easier to zone out. So yeah. I'm like, I have these concrete ideas. All right, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to get these words. I'm going to um, make my wife suffer at night after the kids go to bed where <laughs> I uh, try to say what I want to say as best as I can say it, and then she'll feed me words or we'll correct the grammar just enough. And then after the 10th time of her hearing it, she'll, she would fall asleep during rehearsal, <laughs> which was not so motivating. And then, um, yeah. and I tried also to just like translate it straight kind of, and I, the first couple of times I did stand up in Polish, it was more like trying to do it Shakespeare. I'm like, if I keep the emotion and just say the words, that'll work. But people smell that that was inauthentic and yeah. the language was too perfect. And that's why, like, I'll come to you or, or, or someone else now sometimes with my shittily translated text or I'll be like, take it in English and make something. And then I'll look at that and see if I need to undo anything. But, you know, just getting yeah, outside yeah. help now, which uh, which is fun. To make it more common language or so. Yeah, to not yeah. dress it up too too exactly. literary or something. Exactly. Right? Like, yeah. I just try to get over that line where I'm comprehensible because, because I... Um, I know if you don't understand what I'm saying, then you can't even get the joke. And if you have to think sure. too hard, then people get sick of watching me on stage. But I also know the value in saying things in childish, shitty Polish. Like yeah. it's fun for Polish people to hear how I murder the language. Yeah. And I don't remember if I've asked you this and if we're of the same generation, but Yakov Smirnov. It's funny. I find out found out late about him. Like when I was a kid, I don't think anybody 
mention him to me, even though he was popular like mostly in the, in the late eighties or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so I, I you know I came to the U.S. in ninety. 1990s so he's probably his career was yeah, pretty yeah, much like over by that point just missed it. but like i remember being in seattle and somebody mentioned it to me and and i think it wasn't until then like you know not that many years ago when i found out about there was this guy that had this yeah. tired joke that he would repeat about uh you know well, and you see was... it you still see it in youtube comments and stuff right like in russia a uh, plane flies you or whatever. Yeah, Any, yeah, yeah. That was his whole shtick. He he came from Soviet Russia. He came to the States. He was already a performer in Russia, so it was kind of the same bag. But he had a thick accent, and all of his material was based on America. What a country, he mm-hmm. would say. Or, yeah, in Soviet Russia, car drives you or something. And, yeah. you know, making these cultural observations and, and doing stuff like that that – I didn't intend to do that, but once I was already on the path, I realized maybe that was some kind of subconscious inspiration. Like, yeah. oh, fuck, I'm an American Yakov Smirnov now. <laughs> or maybe more so Balki Bartakamus, which, no, Perfect Him, Strangers, no. May, oh, 80s, maybe early 90s American sitcom based in Chicago. Uh, um, look yeah. it up, kids. Okay. Perfect Strangers. It's still funny. I will, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a few years difference between us, so I'm sure, sure there's some things that... Is it like you? I don't know when the when the generation gap st- starts because like somebody told me a generation is like forty years or something. Maybe so. Technically, we're probably uh, the same generation. But when does it? You know, when does it end? Like, how much younger do you have to be than me to be a new generation? I don't know how that yeah, works. Yeah, it's weird. There's a lot of crossover, but yeah. sometimes like this, even yeah, if there's like one or two ends. years difference, you're just not of an age to notice certain pop culture things yeah exactly yeah but yeah i don't know that much anything that i know from the 80s is like either that i was fortunate enough to already know in poland or that you know i kind of went to look back i don't know reruns on tv maybe but you kind of had to look back and research your own shit whatever yeah Yeah. there's not yeah uh, the 90s was like a whole another era in a lot of ways too right i mean I know that sounds that sounds <coughs> ridiculous, but it really was. It's like so much changed because of of MTV and all that shit. Yeah, exactly, so, yeah. exactly. Um, but yeah, I think I think you mentioned two things that are um, worth uh, underlining is like that you kind of write material or initially wrote m- m- created material by speaking and not something. Yeah, it's like you don't sit down with a paper, which is similar to 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 how I work. You know, it's like yeah. it starts with. This, in your head is something you would say and not so much, okay, I'm going to sit down and start writing from zero. Yeah. Eventually you, you give it form or something, but I think that's maybe a, a misconception that a lot of people might, might have. Yeah. As, or at least that all uh, comedians do it that way. Cause I know some guys that do They'll They'll write things out of their sure. more pen to paper type of guys, yeah. but I've tried and I've really tried to like force myself cause that's how you should do it. And, yeah. and it doesn't work for me. Yeah. I think that's how I started doing it initially when i was first like well the first jokes i had were just simple ideas i didn't that i didn't even write down but yeah afterwards okay i'm gonna write a bit now and that was shit that just didn't work because it it was too it sounded too too contrived like you could tell that it was written before it was spoken i think and and that was kind of and the other thing is, is about learning polish and i think is a good tip for anybody who's trying to learn a foreign language is to like have your own goal or something that you really want to do, you know, like, okay, I want to learn to understand this piece of poetry or this uh, memorized lines from a movie or something and understand them. Like you have your own personal motivation. That's really pushing you to, to learn something Yeah. as opposed to, you know, business English from a book and stuff, which is not going to keep you engaged. Yeah, no, for you gotta, very long. Got to have something to say, and and I don't know if it works for for anybody else to learn a language through stand up because I, I sure. I, yeah. I mean, that's also something, but just I, some kind of emotional in, engagement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what I'm still fascinated with, and and we've had this conversation before talking to some other uh, Polish comedians that who I feel like in just general conversation have very good. English skills better than my Polish, but they're terrified of performing in in English, or they're just like won't, or they have to prepare a lot more. They're very skeptical about it. Yeah, and and okay, maybe it's not so important. Better for me because then I stay more unique. But 
I just I just don't get it. Maybe it just comes from probably having no shame. Like I think that comes <laughs> from the from the clown training because uh, you know just all that clowning and, and having distance to yourself. That I really don't care if I sound like an idiot on stage because yeah. I know I do, and I can accept that and I can laugh at that. Yeah, yeah. But if you're too like, oh God, if I don't say it right, then people would think I'm stupid. Mm-hmm. Then you're gonna have a have a big problem. Yeah. But I'm just I'm just amazed. There's not more. Dual dual performers out here. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's really important in, in learning languages in general. Is that not being afraid to make mistakes? And I think that's the main. I'm you know I'm no no linguist, psycho linguist or anything, but a main reason why like kids learn better and faster than adults do. You know, and people always say, oh, it's much easier to learn when you're little. Well, yeah, it's mostly because you're just more engaged and you're not afraid to make mistakes yeah Yeah. whereas you're an adult you overthink every and the other thing is there's so many good comedians in english you know so those polish people that are maybe initially already afraid to kind of speak english in every day then they have to get on stage and maybe kind of be compared to to uh you know really good english comedians now or in the past you know that just occurred to me now i'm not sure but you know it's kind of like you know even Idiots who've never seen half a stand-up show live, they know about Carlin and Bill Hicks or something, you know? Right. And they keep comparing, right. like, every single <laughs> Joe comedian to those guys. So I, th- I think maybe s- some of those people in the back of their mind are thinking, you know, I'm performing in the language of... Shakespeare and all these other fucks. So and, and they feel <laughs> and they feel closer. There's more pressure, maybe. I they don't feel know. Closer to the pillars if they're in their own language. That's you know, like, like the standard, I think, is really high, and and in Polish, it's more. You're still more of a pioneer, and you're not. You know, there's not that many people that you can say that you're worse than. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, all right. There's a few. I mean, there's quite a few comedians now, but there's not. There's nobody that like. Uh, uh, prior carlin or somebody the equivalent in in polish that you could say oh he's nothing like that guy you know i guess maybe some people would say fucking abelard gizar but that's only because he's popular and not because he has a history of of you know working for years you know right right yeah and if he continues maybe in 20 years that'll kind of be the measuring stick that people like well maybe but he's no giza but okay (laughs) yeah that's that's interesting that it's like yeah you have this pillar of expectation but that's kind of a shitty reason to not do something anyway definitely yeah if you're it like just, oh if i'm not gonna be as good as the best people that have ever done it ever then i'm not gonna <laughs> do it at all <laughs> yeah when you put it that way it's totally <laughs> ridiculous and and i agree it's silly but it's i don't know it just occurred to me now hmm. uh yeah. Well, never mind. I mean, if, never, you're thinking, never, if you're thinking about doing stand up in English, just don't, because that's more money in my pocket. Yeah, that helps yeah. me out. <laughs> I mean, it never, it never uh, crossed my mind, you know, when I was doing my first open mic, whatever. Even though it probably should have, like, eh, maybe I shouldn't even be getting up on stage at all. <laughs> Nobody gives a, show, a shit about my Target department store jokes, or you know, like why? <laughs> but, yeah, but there's so many shitty open micers that I guess that's that's the you talk about like in Seattle, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's that was my <laughs> first time going up. Uh, wh- when did you first do stand up? Because I know you did a bunch of other performance things before then. But when did you first in Wrocław? In Wrocław, okay. So was it any open mics in in English that I you did never, first? I never did stand up uh, in the states. Yeah, I never did an open mic. I was just always a fan. Like I always loved the form, right? But I practically I was more interested in physical comedy and dance and yeah and theater, so I never tried it. And then um, yeah, it was the it was like the clash of cultures that that moved you to to do that. Yeah, I'm meeting a new a foreign culture in Poland part mostly. Of it. And I gotta try part to of remember because there was also part of it too came from a came from a bet. Oh yeah, I'm That's trying to not... remember now because I was at some show and it was. Um, Kuba um, Kshak, I think his last name is. Uh, uh-huh. one, one half of Cabaret Dops. Okay. They're also based out of Wrocław, and there's a lot of, like, you know, Cabaret comedy events in Wrocław, and, and he's a buddy of mine. And I think probably because he was harping on me for my shitty Polish mm-hmm. or something that uh, I think I was already interested in doing stand-up, and he's like, when are you going to do stand-up in Polish? And I was like, in... 
nine months. And he's like, okay. And he put it in his like calendar phone on his, on, on his phone. He's like, now you have to do it. And, and that was, that was part of the, the impetus. So, um, so wait, your first perform, uh, no, stand up was in Polish? No, my first was in uh, English because okay. I realized if I'm even going to come close okay, to that, yeah, I better sure. do it in English first to like know what the hell I'm doing. Yeah. So I, I took all of my ideas, um, and worked them through and set a date and had a friend help me organize the event and turned into this big thing. And it was, I didn't even have, I had a half hour material. So I filled out the rest of the evening by doing, half stand-up and half liquid mime, half of the physical comedy, mm -hmm. you know, like vaudeville stuff. And I got my German buddy to be an MC, and it was really like DIY, do it yeah. yourself, and somehow managed. And then enough people came, they're like, oh, I better do that. Maybe I'll do that again next month. Sure. And then the next month. And then I'm like, I need more time to write new jokes. So anyone else want to? And then collaboration started, and now... Mm -hmm. And now it's now it's every month. But so was, so, how long have you been doing stand up? Um, about three years, I think. Okay. Now. So yeah, yeah. That's a, that's just that's, that's a short time to be to be where you are. I think. I don't know. It seemed, but it's like, but it's so much. You can't really compare it to to anything else, right? Uh, to like stand up in the U.S. or something, because you're just yeah, you're like building I, I, your own, creating your own paths. Really, I, here, I, here. yeah. I, ha I have no. I have no. Um, it, delusions, I guess we'll call it that, that I would be in the same place if I had done the same thing in the States. I know that because there's not even a market, I'm helping build the market for yeah. stand-up in English or even just stand-up in general. Even when I do it in Polish, I'm still one of the first few people doing it out here right. because the market isn't so flooded with, like you said, people going to shitty open mics and trying to carve out any little niche because it's so it's so competitive. Yeah. But the only thing that I'm, I'm proud of for myself and I think what's gotten me so far is just the fact that, like I said, I... I started as a performer and just changed mediums. So for maybe other beginning stand-up comedians that have no stage presence, no stage experience, you have to learn the form, how to be funny, and how to like be in front of a crowd of people. And that was those first two things. I was like, check, check. Yeah, yeah. I can stand here and make an ass of myself and hopefully turn that into a good thing because I have enough creative and performance energy that even if I my jokes aren't so funny I can still kind of pull it off because I can, yeah yeah I can do something so so that, that and the helps. rest is just creating content well, that's easy that's the easy part <laughs> content ah. content <laughs> went in down to do a funny dance and, you know yeah I I know nothing about uh, uh, pantomime but I had uh, Vardek Novak here. I don't know if you, you're f at all familiar Vardek with him. Novak. He was he was on one season on Comedy Central, and and he he's not really known for stand up that much. But he's also been in this business like since he was seventeen or more, or or longer than that. And and he's w way older than us, or at least <laughs> he looks that way. <laughs> but yeah, no. But yeah, but he was talking about a little bit about pantomime, and you mentioned something about uh, uh, two different like approaches or schools from in Poland and in the U.S. and and you mentioned the the guy Marceau, yeah, the yeah, first. yeah. So the, there was like an obvious differentiation, or was it a lack of exposure to With, without two different... without getting too nerdy about it? Because okay. I could go on. This would not be interesting. Maybe my life <laughs> stories and comedy would be interesting for an audience, but I don't okay. think the whole history of pantomime. But basically. Um, uh, most of, if you ever see a pantomime in the States, it's mostly based off of the French style, which okay. was started by a guy named Etienne de Creux back in whatever long time ago. And Marcel Marceau, like, uh, one of the biggest names of the most famous pantomime was right. a student of his, um, <clears throat> and made that form popular, but... Because of the divide in Europe, there was no real dialogue. And coincidentally, okay. parallel in Poland, uh, Henryk Tomaszewski was also developing a silent form of uh, physical theater. Uh, right. But the styles were very different. So like French is more ballet and lyrical and light and and go figure the Polish version is very grounded and heavy and all mm -hmm. of the movements like... Um, if you, if you see any Polish pantomime, uh, performance, usually all of the actors are just like physically ripped yeah. because of the weight that they do everything and, and they get themselves into these like, um, 
asymmetrical positions and in really uncomfortable, like basically the theory is if it hurts, it probably looks good on stage. So you get yourself <laughs> in these really contorted wow. positions and balance on one leg and all this crazy stuff. And then even the acting style too is just like heavy stuff. Yeah. And in, in the French pantomime, it's more symmetrical. Your left side does something similar or complements your right side. And uh-huh. It can still be dramatic and, and sad, but there's not this like... I don't know how else to say it, but you watch a performance and you just feel this, like, weight. Or it's kind of comparable to, like, those big Soviet-era era statues you see around um, uh, Platz or Sala Congress over here in Warsaw. You know, like, yeah, yeah. the workers with the big hands and yeah, the, the big chiseled muscles. And right. The, yeah. Like, that's that's totally in the Polish style <laughs> of pantomime. That's interesting, yeah. So, okay, you do pantomime, you, do, you have your own... Uh, liquid mime show that you do with with your wife yeah, yeah. You, uh you do some improv as well yeah just uh, started to again because improv is booming in poland yeah. and i have the same hunger as i did with stand-up of like watching uh, watching the whole industry explode and you know, like well fuck if everyone else is doing it yeah i can too because i did improv in college man like yeah, yeah. i know this and and less competition if we do it so we have a little group now that we do it in english and from time to time i'll be a guest in my wife's improv group improkratia for those of you that are in Wrocław. yeah um and i'll be a special guest and try to improv in polish too which i manage and i do more physical stuff but it's not something i could do all the time i think people get sick of that yeah but, sure um i just I, I i love the form and it helps in inform everything else i do because it really helps you think on your feet be open to situations and propositions and and it just be more more spontaneous yeah so yeah um and that works into the the physical comedy. Like what we do with Liquid Mime is not strictly pantomime. Actually, we're kind of black sheep in that too. Like sometimes we apply to pantomime festivals, and they're like, "No, because you make sound effects." Because I wear a microport and I do right. some like umbilical brothers type stuff, and that disqualifies us from the purest mimes that are like can be no sound. Right. So you are not mimes. But then other forms of art are like no you're not this you're that and sure yeah. you know so it's a, just a conglomeration of stuff so it's clown it's physical comedy sound effects they do a little beatboxing and yeah. it's like we just try to make a live action cartoon is is the main thing right so and uh, yeah and you do charity work on top of that or like well, it's not, it's not or... charity work okay um, no, all right. <laughs> sorry. Not, i'm not gonna jump down your throat but yeah just to um but that because that's my job i okay, mean it's okay. it's uh it's a social action that I feel very strongly about, and it's yeah. for a cause. Um, I'm a medical clown. I go into hospitals, and I, I clown for the patients, for their parents, for the staff, uh, for basically anyone that is in the hospital. But I had to go through extensive training uh, to do that, and the organization I work with is called Czerwoninowski, which is under the larger umbrella of Red Noses International that exists in 10 other uh, European countries, plus Palestine, plus New Zealand. Um, and the way we try to describe our work is that we're an artistic organization with a social miss- mission rather than being a social organization with an artistic mission because uh, maybe some people are more familiar with Dr. Clown. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's great that they're also trying to help a cause because uh, the the effect – that humor can have in a hospital setting where people are under so much stress and and there's so much going on can really be uh, beneficial. And we're actually trying now to push more uh, medical research to confirm what we've known all along. And it's just now starting to come out. Like scientists are actually looking at what we do and going, oh, wow, we can see in the CT scan and blah, 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 that yeah, when that there is some... has a measurable positive influence on yeah, yeah, what you're doing. Which, yeah. which is crazy and great because we're like, well, yeah, we've kind of intuitively known that from seeing the uh, the effects but we've had no science to back it up but anyway um there, there's dr clown which is an older organization in uh, in poland but it is a volunteer organization and uh often they get students or uh, doctors themselves or people of more of a pedagogy uh, related to the science uh, sciences mm-hmm. uh, that are that become their clowns 
Uh, but the whole thing with Cervononoski and Red Noses is that uh, we're artists first, and we try to maintain yeah. the highest level of artistry and professionalism. Because we're paid, that means we have to be there every week, and we're held accountable for that. And um, it, it it's it's a job, so we yeah, have yeah. Uh, you know constant constant training, and and just trying to maintain the highest quality of of excellence to to do this thing. But it's yeah, that's that's my dream job. If we had five hours, I would talk just about Jim Onanoski, um because yeah. that's it's just fucking it's just fucking awesome. I don't know how else to say it. Like you can it's you can the, you can okay. see the effect often immediately, and you get yourself in these because you never know what's going to happen. Every day is different, and even if you have a plan, it's going to be something else. And uh, like you just I don't know I don't know. Um, trying to think any kind of quick anecdotes because yeah. there's just so much now because I do it uh, at least once a week we just started a program in and Poland. you travel a lot with that as well yeah yeah or, that's or... more just my position because I'm the deputy artistic okay. director so um, also because this is something that I did back in the states when I was in Chicago I was part of Big Apple Circus Clown Care Unit uh, which is a similar organization, taking uh -huh. the best artists of Chicago and sending them to the hospital to get freaky with with all the people there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I've, I've been in Poznan because we're starting a program out there and I had to train all the new clowns. Sometimes I'll go to Krakow either for coaching or to, to cover another day for one of the clowns that can't make it. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> But it's mostly uh, local. It's not like people tour. You'll right. Have yeah. No, we have we have we have, stuff, yeah. we have teams. We have teams in each city that pretty much stay put unless something comes up and then we move around um, and see. That's just another cause for me to travel. I'm like, what? We need a clown in Poznan. I'll be there. No yeah. problem. I'll sit on a bus for three hours if I can go, you know, play with uh, with, with people in the hospital because it's just it's crazy. Like. It's it's from long ago before I was in Chervonenoski because when Anka and I came here, she's also a medical clown, mm -hmm. and we've tried to do our own actions because it was something that we wanted to do, but we are not administrators, so we like met with lawyers about how to start an official NGO, and then all fucking fell apart. But we did have an opportunity one time to, uh, uh, through some theater festival, they got us some funding and some support to go to the oncology department in Wrocław, and we spent eight hours clowning the the whole day in like two different locations. Wow. And there was this one, there was this one room. Um, it was kind of like half outpatient, half inpatient. There was um, a boy after chemo who had no hair, and a girl after chemo she had no hair, and she was going home. So she was all happy when we started to play with her. And the boy was there lying on his side, and he just looked like he was in pain, and he ignored us, and he didn't want any interaction. We tried to, like, you know, connect with him somehow, and mm -hmm. he was just having none of it, and he was complaining and crying. And so we kind of tried to just focus on the girl, but always have our peripheral vision open to if there would be any kind of window for connection there. And, yeah. you know, playing with the girl, playing with the girl, and the boy finally started to get interested, and then... um I forget what the final impetus was, but at one point he just went, uh, he gave me the finger. <laughs> and, and, and like at first I was like just startled. And then I took that and that's how the clown works. You take an offer. And so like I, I, I mocked being offended. I was like, oh, 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 I'm so offended. I'm so yeah. offended. He's like, ha ha, because you can't do it back to me. Because he knew he said that too in Polish, and That's then funny. he just started to say all the swear words he know in English, he know he knew in English. So he was like "fuck you, shit, fuck, shit, fuck you, fuck, fuck, fuck." But you can't say the same because yeah. you're you can't. Okay. And and we just turned we like basically just gave this kid some outlet to just vent his shit because yeah. who you know it's not an easy pleasant situation to be like a five year old. With fucking cancer, yeah. you know, and 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 to be told you're going to get an IV right now, whether you like it or not, you're going to have to do this and you have to do that. So they get very little choice, and we just try to empower them as much as possible right. and be kind of under them as as much That's as we can. Kind of, yeah, it's impressive, but it's it, kind of uh, hard it, to, to to imagine all that. Okay, so because <laughs> my next question was going to be. You do all this stuff, like which I'm not gonna repeat all of it again. <laughs> so why why would I do that? That's so stupid. No, we do you, you do pantomime, improv, uh, stand up, Czerwonenowski, uh, uh, and and I was gonna ask. I mean, I wasn't really gonna compare that last thing because to me, it's like it's a whole separate calling. But do you have a a favorite of uh, at least of all the different disciplines that you kind of participate in? Do you have one? I know it's just a pretty silly question, but is that one that's most satisfying? Or if you had to choose, you know, that's like 
I mean, it's, it's not. Not it's really. Not, it's not silly, and it's it's interesting, and I'll I'll probably be thinking about that for the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> a lot of it, a lot of it, just goes with um, you know. There's peaks and valleys. Sure. That uh, like right now we play maybe one liquid mime show every couple of months, which is cool because it makes it exciting now. Like uh, back when I had the appearance on Mom Talent and we were getting a lot of requests and a lot of calls and we were doing the show the whole time. That was another situation that I was performing all the time with my wife, being a parent with my wife, living with my wife, and we just got like burnt out on each other. Like, I don't want to look at you anymore. Yeah. Um, so then she started doing improv. I started doing stand-up. And I, I just fell in love with the form. I, I just I really love doing stand up, and I got kind of burnt out on physical comedy, so it didn't even interest me if there was a show mm-hmm. to see of someone else. I'm like, I don't have to watch that or some great movie with physical comedy. Um, wasn't wasn't that into it, but yeah. now I'm starting to feel the hunger again, you know. And like we watched some Buster Keaton movies the other night, actually, just randomly, and I was like, fuck that guy's. Yeah, he's Beast. amazing. Yeah, like I mean, I'm not really into physical comedy. I not and I know nothing about it from the technical side. But I, when I see him, and when like, you watch I him like tell, flip, it's... spin on his head, and then like do a bunch of create or have yeah. the house fall over him, and he goes through the window. It was like, <laughs> he, yeah, he's just he was just an animal of the time. He was You're amazing. Right. Um, so that's uh, that's awesome. And then with the Chervonenowski work, one there's the social calling two. Um, yeah, like it's it's just it's live 360 on the spot performance like you're just on and there's there's rules but there are no rules and we still try to have artistic form to it and we take these workshops that keep us developing just in the form of clown that from all my training and maybe someday if we have the time we'll do like an adult new school vaudevillian show uh of 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 two clowns. Yeah. Um because that is also like your character comes from uh, inside of you. I equate it a lot to to pro wrestling. That like mm-hmm. you know you have these archetypes. Or you have a guy that's like he comes from a well off family. Good. So let's just inflate that to the to the nth degree, mm-hmm. and that becomes your thing. And it's the same thing. I'm kind of uh, I'm learning that I'm kind of a pedantic uh, I'm kind of a pedantic guy. So that mm-hmm. comes out in my clown. I'm like. Everything has to be just this way, or if I know something, then I'm kind of a smart ass. Yeah, that yeah. that comes out too, and and uh, and just the play from that. So mm-hmm. that's that's incredible. But that can also get kind of tiring because I'm also on the administrative side. I have I have right. office work to do, and I have to I have to I go go to meetings. I go to Vienna from time to time to sit <laughs> in a round of tables and talk about uh, administrative business. You stuff. guys all wearing uh, red noses. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah. sadly, no. Maybe it would help. <laughs> Maybe it would help us make uh, make things move faster and smoother. Yeah. But um, I just like, for better or worse, because I it's, it's my career, my lifestyle, and my art is I'm aware like semi masochistic because right. I have trouble saying no to projects when they fall on my lap, and I really don't like doing one thing. Yeah. So I just take on a bunch of projects of shit that I love to do, and then I overcommit myself when I get overwhelmed, and I'm constantly like fighting to make a deadline. And why did I fucking agree to do this? This is crazy. But at the same time, like I, I just enjoy everything I do, or because I do so many different things, then I do even more different things. Like I was just in that music video uh, a couple of months ago. I got right. to be in a music video. It was my first one. Maybe it'll be my only one. But I had that experience yeah. because of all the other shit that I was doing, and that was crazy. It was it was great. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah. Like right now, the concentration is on stand up, and I really love I love the club scene. Um, I can say that too. Like playing for bigger audiences, I'm capable of, and I don't mind. Right. But right now, I just kind of have a I got a nice big itch to be. You know, yeah. hundred people max, hopefully underground, and and just doing it. Yeah, that specific vibe, and where you still have contact with yeah. with the audience. Yeah, but that's okay, you know closely. that's not going to last forever. And like I said, hopefully in the next year or two there'll be some new physical comedy form because I want to get back into that. But yeah, I just have to do everything. Yeah, all the no. time. <laughs> yeah. Are are you a little bit uh, ADHD? You don't seem so, or ADD, whatever that's called now. I don't know. I never got tested. I don't think so. Because no. I, because usually, like, that's I don't know if this qualifies. Like when I work on one thing, I'm all about that one okay, thing. Yeah. 
but then I have to leave that and work on something else. Yeah. And that's where the diversity comes in and trying yeah, to juggle sure different mean. projects. But, um, and that's why sometimes it's hard to change hats. But like, if I'm doing this one thing that I'm all about, you're focused that on thing. that one yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's a, and I think in the creative field, it's a good strategy or attitude to have is not, get too bogged down in one thing for too long because like you said you just get a little tired of it yeah it becomes too routine or something yeah. you take a break do something else and you got different energy going you get burned and then out. maybe you can you know try that other thing with a with a new approach or whatever with just a and it, and it take all, a breath right yeah, yeah and it all informs everything else like i yeah. i enjoy being a rounded performer and maybe i'm not a master of anything and Plenty of people can claim to be better than me in any of the one things that I do if they do that that one thing. But just that, yeah. I just I feel like I give a more deep performance, and I have a deeper experience because I bring an element of clown into stand up. I bring a little bit of stand up into the physical comedy. I bring a little bit of this into that, and it yeah. all it all works together. Yeah, people respond well to you, and I think I think people usually when they see your stand up, they usually like you, which is I kind of envy that, you know. It's like because like, I just I would uh, I guess I can be, but I never think of myself as the type of likable comedian. It's, really, uh, I I guess I just have a very different perspective, and I've seen you in more in English, but I have seen you perform in Polish, and I've always had the opinion that. I mean, I don't. Know, I can't. I don't know about your your persona or your person on stage. Yeah, yeah. Whether that's likable, but your presence on stage, I, I feel like you're a person I can watch. Like even if one joke doesn't go over, I'll sit there and give you the benefit of the doubt because yeah. probably the next thing will be, and I can. You have my attention. Huh. You know, you, you, well, you that's got that. That's nice. That's good. I guess I'm just yeah. Maybe part of that is me wanting to have a type <laughs> of humor or or persona that is more like. Uh, a smart ass and a little bit above and uh yeah and when that doesn't fly then the, then they don't like you because obviously because you're trying because you're trying to be a dick and be better and it's not working right you're right. not funny so then they yeah they and really maybe don't. that's where the self distance comes in like even yeah, if like, i try to be better i know that ultimately i'm i'm not especially if i'm saying anything in in polish and i i it's all an act I yeah yeah well then you have to have humility if you're Kind of embarrassing yourself by making mistakes or whatever. Yeah. yeah, which sounds ridiculous for someone that calls himself famous Jim Williams to say. But <laughs> it's all just yeah. been a joke all along, anyway. I'm like, that's that, that, that yeah. you know, with the asterisk, not actually famous, right? It's the whole. That's that's just a joke in and of itself. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah, because because <laughs> Jim Williams. <coughs> Uh, were you named after anybody? Other Jim? I guess mostly women in your family, because so, so there's not like a bunch of Jims to be named after or something. But yeah, no, no, no it was just uh, just all American. Okay. Yeah, the all so American. is it is it Jim and and James or no? You're just yeah, Jim. yeah. Okay. Well, actually, I mean, if we want to go, we well, we can go all the way back because um, a lot of people may not know that. It, I I didn't even realize that for a long time. That yeah, it's the Jim same. is short for James. I don't know if there's. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations about what the equivalent is for Polish names and the closest is uh, Jakub Kuba which is more Jacob but I guess if you trace the linguistic roots yeah, of those two names are... it's the same but there's there's really no equivalent which I think is weird because like there's the, bo- there's the St. Name, James right? Bible so who in Polish wrote the St. James Bible? Well, is it, yeah but isn't St. James like uh, St. James Bible an American thing like uh one of those groups of ca- Catholics? Well, maybe. I, th- I think it is. I think it is. But I, what <laughs> shows how good of a Catholic? Yeah, I am. exactly. Yeah, um, I don't know too much about that either. But uh, I always thought that was a thing that you only see in, <laughs> excuse me, American hotels. It's the same, <laughs> the Saint James Bible. It never says that on a, on a Polish Bible. I'm, I'm sure there's different versions as well. But right. I don't fucking know who St. James is anyway. <laughs> but yeah. So so your birth certificate says James. Oh, no, yeah, James yeah, my birth certificate says James. It says James Carl Stieber because my, okay. my first last name was Stieber. But then my dad passed away when I was little. My mom got remarried. Okay. And when you're 13 and you're faced with a question, do you want to take your stepdad's last name, which is Williams? My real only thinking at that time as, no, I was 11, was um, Stieber. S-T-I-E-B-E-R. Uh, if you're an American that reads that, you will always mispronounce it Stiber. Mm. And after 11 years of having Stiber, 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 I'm like, hmm, 
I could take a last name that no one can mispronounce. Let's go for that. Yeah. So okay. that was that impetus. But then that just meant that I had a very generic name. And it's like John Smith, Jim Williams. Yeah. Yeah. On the official hierarchy, because I've looked at this, Williams is like the third most common last name. And Jim James is like the third most common first name. So you put those oh. together and <laughs> it's just as generic as you can get. Yeah. This. um because this is uh, something I think about sometimes, or I have thought about not anymore, but uh, have you ever thought about changing your name or having an alias for show business or something? I did. I did. Uh, and that was actually when I was in Chicago, just like starting my yeah. career and then thinking about like, you know, uh, what if I went back to Steber? Because at least there's no no other, uh, that's not a very popular last name, maybe more recognizable. Yeah. But my... Uh, my good friend and my mentor at the time was like, you know what? You're already Jim Williams and you're already making that name. Just be you. Yeah. Um, and then I guess that also kind of ties into the, the famous Jim Williams moniker that, the, that I use sometimes again, not as like an ego stroke, but it really does make it easier to find me on a Facebook. Like I meet sure, somebody yeah. and they're like, how can I find you? I'm like Jim Williams. I'm like, there's so many of them. Like, so go back and just type famous, type in famous Jim Williams. Oh, you're the first one. Boom. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm like, if, if I have to be Jim Williams, then I might as well be famous. <laughs> I think was the, the thought there. Yeah. But yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah and, and at this point you wouldn't do it probably cause you, you have, you're recognizable now, at least yeah. in Poland, right? And so. Yeah, yeah. And you, you know, sometimes you just work with what you got. And sure. Yeah, Gavo maybe is not the most easy name, but yeah. God damn it, I haven't met any other stand upers in Poland yet named Gavo. Yeah, me so, neither. Boom. Me neither. Although I'm always surprised, and it's happened a number of times where people tell me, like, oh, you're the second or even third Gavo that I've met. And I'm like, really? I've only met one other Gavo in my entire life. And, wow. it was, and I was kind of surprised at the time. So. It was, it was weird, but yeah, there's a lot of people last, with the last name Gavo for some oh, reason. That can I be really a last don't name know why, too. but yeah, I think as as far as com being common, that it's much more common for the for. Uh, the, I, I, I don't know. think I've met one, but I, I just I just know that from like looking it up or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I don't even know where it comes from. It's weird. I still think it might be from the little children's poem, yeah, but. Uh, Fuck if I know. Somebody just had... At least you're not Jimmy Crack humor. Corn and I don't care. <laughs> Jimmy Crack Corn, I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn, I don't care. Yeah, but it's... All. Yeah, but it's not like people in the U.S. make fun of you for being named Jim, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. They do? Oh, God. Come on. That Yeah, Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. Um, there's some other song that's, oh, Jimmy Jimmy or something. Uh-huh. And then uh, Slim Jim. Okay. Which no one in Poland will know, but it's a beef sausage treat that yeah. Macho Man Randy Savage used to be the spokesman for, but right. snap into a Slim Jim. So, yeah. especially because I'm skinny, I always was like, oh, Slim Jim, Slim Jim. Okay. <laughs> yeah, was, I guess I guess you're right. Just kids especially will think of, they'll think of any anything. fucking thing yeah. that they can make funny. Yeah, Jimbo. I was Jimbo in high school, for better or worse. That yeah. was not my favorite. My friends, like, they meant it in a nice way. Like, oh, Jimbo. I'm like, okay, I fine. always wondered where, where the hell that comes from. I just I don't know making making it two syllables to kind of bounce it off the tongue easier. I don't know where with Jimbo they don't do that with any other name, do they? No, no there's no, no Timbo. There's no Kimbo. Well, right, actually, there is Kimbo Slice, the MMA fighter. Yeah, that's true. But that's it. It's just, that's yeah, it's me, it's me and Kimbo Slice. <laughs> Jimbo <laughs> and Kimbo. Maybe That'd be a great comedy duo. Yeah, I should like, call him up. That's what I was just thinking. Is like, is he still trying to do MMA? Because maybe he'd be into you know improv or something. <laughs> or we could do like you know, comedy and cage fighting. <laughs> yeah. Which is uh, when I first saw Kimbo Slice backyard fighting video. To me, it kind of was comedy. So I was like, uh, I don't know. There's an element there that you that you de- you would definitely have that. Uh, that kind of irony hipster <laughs> vibe pos- potential there. I mean, you could definitely go for that. And he uh, could explore new artistic territory. <laughs> Do you know where he's from, by the way? I was just Isn't wondering. He's from, uh, I want to say Detroit. Oh, okay. Because I've been watching for whatever stupid reason. I've been watching MMA yeah. lately and some Kimbo Slice videos. And when they announce from, I think he's from Michigan, from Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. I think. Yeah. You've he's, been to Detroit? Oh, yeah. 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 And, I mean, it was some years ago, um, and actually lived in a suburb for a summer of Detroit. Oh, wow. I stayed with a friend, and I worked at a restaurant. Like, just, you know, in between college semesters. Where right. I don't want to go back home, I'll go here. I had a friend 
Um, but Detroit, Detroit, at least at the time that I was there and that I've traveled through and done shows for uh, school age children, I can see why the city tried to burn itself down on numerous occasions. Like, yeah. there's just something in the air at this point of like, we Failure. just need to like <laughs> wipe it out yeah. and start from scratch. Like, burn it down. This is, it's harsh. That's crazy. Um, I don't know if it's still like that, and I'm sure not all parts of Detroit are. Uh, there's still the Detroit Symphony Orchestra that's very world renowned, and right. I want to, yeah, I don't want to hate on any Detroiters. Just yeah, I mean, that's a the lot impression of I got. good stu- music and all that came out of there. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm a giant Eminem yeah, fan, and he wouldn't be Eminem if he didn't grow up in Detroit. Yeah, right? probably not. Yeah, is it? Is it a? It's not really a punchline for jokes or anything. Like Wuj or Rada might be in. <laughs> In Poland, right? It's not that kind of... People don't make fun of Detroit, do they? It's more like a sympathy thing, right? Where, the, Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. No, and that's... Yeah, that's usually not like the, the butt of the joke. Cleveland is, and that's something from being from Cleveland, because all of our sports teams suck, or uh-huh. one time before I was born, the lake caught on fire because it was so polluted. <laughs> so Cleveland is called the mistake by the lake. That happens to rhyme. Okay. But usually, uh, it's usually like the southern states that get the most flack. You're like, that's the armpit of America. Yeah. D- um, does Cleveland, uh, does Ohio have a specific accent or something like a dialect? Actually, it no. Um, no, not I- identifiable to, anyway to most. For the for the most part, and this is this is actually factually uh, true, is that that kind of like Midwest region, Cleveland, Ohio. Parts of Wisconsin and, and Michigan um, have what's called the non-accent accent because it's the most neutral. Oh. So a lot of newscasters you will find in various parts of the country are originally from that part of the country because they can communicate in a very neutral way. Yeah. Because like you won't hear in my voice a lot of um, the only thing that's characteristic about Cleveland that like I hear from my family and I go back is very nasal mm-hmm. and like the A is very like my older sister shows like where's my panties I can't find my panties I can't find him <laughs> yeah. it just totally goes up in your nose and and uh, Wisconsin right I can't do a good Wisconsin but they have their own little thing but they do yeah in kind of like in the center of all of that region is just kind of like we just speak English that is. With no characteristic whatsoever. Right. It's nothing like like Philly or something. Oh, yeah. No, no. (laughs) Which is sometimes too bad because you don't have like this real strong characteristic accent. And I get jealous of people that are like, boom, ba dang, dang, dang. And this is actually how I talk. (laughs) Oh, that's like interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or why I love it when people speak. I'm just, I'm infatuated with with non-native speakers of English. I love accents, and yeah. I think it just sounds cooler. Like, part of working with the with the Red Noses is because there's all these partner countries. I'll go to a meeting or I'll go to a, a workshop, and there's Czechs and Croatians and Slovakians and Slovenians and Germans, like all these mix of cultures, and we're all speaking English. And just, ah, I could swim in their accents. They just all sound amazing how they how they have just a different way of saying stuff and maybe you yeah. can be self-conscious like, oh that's not exactly how you but sure it's just you know it's it gives a spice i like uh, the spice well that's, yeah that's that's a good attitude to oh fuck it's snowing like crazy mm. that's insane oh that's gonna be fun <laughs> It's a good attitude to have because most Americans will probably say, like, are you all sound Russian or something? <laughs> like, that is the assumption. Yeah. If you're Polish, they're like, where are you from, Russia? Yeah. Yeah, maybe they'll still think that Poland is a part of Russia. Yeah, and, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, obviously I'm making a cruel generalization. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess if you don't have an ear for it or you haven't heard a lot of different accents, you just can't tell the difference yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah. But I do think that's true. And I had that conversation with a couple of people last time I was back stateside was, uh, you know, like we're obviously not known for picking up foreign languages. Yeah. But a lot of Americans have uh, uh, accent envy. Like you meet someone from another country that's speaking English and they're in the States like, ah. Oh, you just talk so cool. Why can't I talk like you? I just right. talk like normal American American. Yeah. So we would rather, instead of learning a foreign language, we would rather just learn the accent and spe- still speak English like with a Russian accent. Yeah. And we'd be like, that's kind of like a foreign language, and now I sound cool. Yeah. It's so funny because like, when I came into the U.S., I wanted nothing more than to just fit in, you know, sound 
normal like the rest of the people there yeah. and i was always embarrassed for uh, for my parents you know who never lost it. and and i'm sure they were at, at at you know to some degree as well right they never lost their accent so mm-hmm. so immediately labeled as as immigrants foreigners whatever and all this stuff that that came with that so and you know in a place like texas they do treat you a little differently I it's, can no, there's there's not you know there's not probably a not enough diversity for it to, for it to be normal, you know. It's like yeah, it's, in New York, they'll they'll fucking tell you who you are. Oh, you fucking immigrant bastard! But it's it's but, but it's that, usually that, another that immigrant worst, telling you that. That was the worst. In New, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was the worst New York impression ever. But uh, uh, yeah, it's it's not out of the ordinary or something, and it's just another element, right? Whereas in Texas, you're you're either Mexican or one of those other people. <laughs> So it's like you're, you're, you could be Mexican, Asian, and whatever the fuck, like white, but still foreign. Yeah, that's the, the other group. You're not think. American. Not you're American. either American. Or you're not American. Pretty much. That's, yeah, yeah I, that's that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> and it, was, it was funny to see it because I got to see that that generation gap as well, right? Because uh, kids of other immigrant parents who were already very much americanized and felt american but they kind of experienced that same sort of uh, ra- racism and that and there because yeah like asian kids or whatever who were american but their their parents had, were first or second generation and, and yeah, and yeah that's where you get a lot of flack you try yeah. to blend in as much as you can and i remember kids like we had we had um so middle eastern families in my elementary school and middle school growing up and like the kids were just like regular kids but oh like riding on the bus and watching them get out and then having their parents come out and greet them on the on the steps or something was just like ripe for middle school racist ah uh-huh, habib 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 something sure, something yeah. and you know they couldn't get past that even though they themselves were born there and spoke it's but you carry your parents baggage yeah yeah identity yeah, and like we said, kids, wh- whatever's different about you, they're like they'll like to point that out. So, uh, yeah, I, this is this is my the weakest uh, element of my podcast is I never fucking know how to end. This. <laughs> uh, I th- I think we're at a good spot to uh, to wrap it up. This was I enjoyed doing this. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for asking me questions and letting me ramble about all kinds of random shit. Yeah, thanks um, for for taking the time to to come down here. No problem. Um, thank you, Jim. Thanks, Gabo. All right, then.